Hello and welcome. Welcome to our premier event of the spring 2021 Music Talks and Tea Events hosted by Hunter College Department of Music. Today, we are pleased to present Ukrainian hip hop in the world. Leah Batstone is a musicologist specializing in the intersections of art music, philosophy, and politics in Fan de Siècle, Austria and 20th century Ukraine. She is currently working a book project about Ukrainian art music of the past 100 years as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Vienna. Before the start of her fellowship, she taught in the Hunter College Music Department as a member of the music history faculty and in summer of 2021, she will be teaching a special topics course in opera studies focusing exclusively on the works of African American composers at Hunter. Professor Batstone will be moderating, moderating this afternoon's event. Welcome Leah. Thank you, Brad. It's great to be here. And thanks so much to everyone who is in attendance, both here in Zoom and also on the YouTube Live. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to the music department and to the Russian and Eastern European Cultures program at Hunter, who are co-hosting this event. And just to let people know that wherever you're watching, please feel free to submit questions at any point in the chat, either on YouTube or in Zoom. And we will be monitoring those questions and there'll be time for Q&A at the end of the presentations. So today's event is something I'm really excited about. Um, it is a discussion with uh, Dr. Adriana Helbig, Dr. Maria Sonovitsky, and Dr. Galina Yarmanova about hip hop in Ukraine and the role of this music in the country's contemporary history, especially around issues of politics, class, and gender. Um, so I'm really excited to share this repertoire. Ukrainian hip hop is wonderful. I hope maybe we'll have some converts after this presentation who will add some Ukrainian artists to their uh, Spotify playlists. Um, so we're going to start with the presentation by Dr. Helbig. So Dr. Helbig is an associate professor of music and the present acting chair of music and the former assistant dean of undergraduates at the University of Pittsburgh, where she teaches courses on world music, global hip hop, Romani music, music and disability studies, prison sounds, and bluegrass. She's a recipient of fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Councils for um, International Education, and Fulbright. She's the author of Hip Hop Ukraine, Music, Race, and African Migration, which came out in 2014 and the co-editor of Hip Hop at Europe's Edge, Music Agency and Social Change, which came out in 2017. Her most recent book, which is called Resounding Poverty, Romani Music and Development Aid, analyzes the impact of foreign funding on musical repertoires of impoverished Roma in the Transcarpathian region of Ukraine. It's really good to have you, Adriana. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you much, uh, very much, uh, Leah. And actually, as I'm listening to my bio, the only thing I keep thinking of is most of the time I was just trying to find how to get from one place to another in, in a country that has really gone through such incredible change in the last 20 years. So I congratulate you uh, on your accomplishments. This is fantastic. I love seeing the second, you know, the next generation of scholars and, and everything you've accomplished. So thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Hunter College, um, College, you know, Department of Music, uh, Reese, um, and welcome, uh, Maria Sonovitsky. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on a panel with you and Galina Yarmanova um, as well. So today, uh, actually, let me just uh, share my screen and get us going here. So today I want to uh, basically walk us through the history of Ukrainian hip hop. And the reason why I think I was almost taken aback by, by this biography that, you know, of myself and of my colleagues is that uh, Ukrainian research uh, on popular music uh, has skyrocketed. Uh, in the last 10 years, um, and precisely because there have been so many changes and so many exciting changes in the popular music sphere. Uh, 
uh, when we consider the history of Ukrainian hip hop, we actually have to consider it in the context of numerous other genres. And so before I launch into this, I want to simply ask the question, what makes music political? And the reason why I ask this is because most music in Ukraine is political. It's politicized by either the musicians, by the audiences, uh, by the producers, uh, by government officials. Uh, music has always been at the creative front of moving and changing things in Ukraine. And so when we analyze this music, we first look at the lyrics, we look at the content and the extent of social commentary we look at symbolic language and references that sometimes only the musician and the audience can understand. So to subvert censorship, uh, we look at the performance context. So are musicians performing on a public stage? Are they performing somewhere in private? Is this because again, they are on a blacklist, uh, which is typical for uh, many musicians uh, in Ukraine, especially in the history of those that were active uh, during Soviet times, but also also, when we consider Ukraine having gone through two major revolutions in 2004 and 2014, and also the breakup of the Soviet Union that had musicians at the forefront. So performance context is crucial. The modes of production, uh, are these uh, musical forms, are they being recorded in uh, studios? Are they government sanctioned studios as in uh, the Soviet context? Are they being disseminated uh, and circulated through music industries or underground uh, as much music has been circulated in Ukraine? We also look to see whether the music reflects the per performer's personal views or if this performer is being paid on behalf and, and performing on, uh, on behalf of, of somebody else. And so uh, as, is, as is typical in Ukraine, um, there are lists sometimes uh, published where politicians, uh, the association between politicians and musicians becomes clear. And then we also just look to the extent to which the musicians push the boundaries of existing norms. So are they, whether they be social or political or economic, um, we look again to see that the musicians are always at the forefront. And this is not just for musicians, this is artists, this is in theater. And this is one of the particularities of, of um, uh, creative uh, research in Eastern Europe. So the music genres that I'll walk us through briefly, uh, and you can see here uh, whether folklore, jazz, rock, pop, or hip hop, each of these dates that I've put in actually has the 1990s as a pivotal change. So something happens, especially in the early 1990s, and it's explained, of course, by the collapse of the Soviet Union and the transitions um, that each of the uh, former Soviet republics undergoes. Um, with Ukraine, it becomes very dramatic to the extent that Ukraine has always been one of the closely aligned, not so much closely aligned, but the, the power dynamics uh, have been very specific uh, with regard to Moscow and with regard to um, the, the Russian leadership with Ukraine. So we're thinking of folklore. Um, there were very specific ways that Ukrainian folklore was uh, altered um, and utilized by the Soviet regime, jazz, rock, pop, and hip hop. So I'll walk us through very briefly uh, with musical folklore. I won't spend too much time on this, but what's interesting is that folklore has come up now in numerous ways in all forms of popular music in Ukraine. So whether you're looking at rock or whether you're looking at folk fusion or uh, authentica, which is the uh, collection of folklore from villages and the recreation in an authentic style. And again, I'll, I'll put it in scare quotes, but with great respect to my colleagues of learning the specific styles that were prevalent in um, rural areas, especially before uh, Soviet um, uh, occupation. And uh, the Soviet uh, governments had very 
uh, clear reasons for wanting to change some of that folklore. Uh, the reasons being the close ties that folklore has to land, um, ecology, religion, kinship. And so altering lyrics and altering places where folklore was uh, performed um, altered the ways that uh, people viewed folklore. Fake lore is, is a way that uh, some people refer to what then uh, ended up on stages, but also this return uh, to folklore. So we'll uh, leave it at that. And I know it might sound a little bit cryptic, but as we uh, show the examples, um, it'll become a little bit clearer. Jazz, very interesting that jazz uh, plays a very important role on the development of hip hop in Ukraine. It's associated as an African-American genre. It starts to come into the Soviet Union in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, there is a very clear alignment of jazz with African-American histories um, circulating uh, into the Soviet Union um, through uh, American musicians, but also those that are working in Paris at this time. We also have the introduction of new instruments. Um, these instruments start to cause a lot of um, anxiety for uh, Soviet officials who then start to uh, very seriously censor jazz uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, there's a lot of censorship of jazz also in Nazi Germany. So, so this, this motion of censoring uh, jazz as uh, something that is inappropriate, as, as moving uh, the social norms beyond um, acceptable oral experiences is something that's very strong. Um, by default then, it positions jazz as a very strongly politicized genre. Uh, so, and that, that, politization of genres you can see is relational because jazz becomes depoliticized in the 1990s. So once the Soviet Union collapses and the lack of um, tension uh, uh, is, uh, comes into play, um, jazz starts to develop in completely different ways, not necessarily as anti-establishment um, as it is through most of Soviet history. Rock music, um, much has been written about rock music bringing down the wall, bringing down uh, the, the, the curtain, uh, the iron curtain. Um, with lyrics, uh, it's very important um, because they become very overt. Uh, much of uh, rock music is very critical of the Soviet regime. Um, rock is politicized for many reasons. One is uh, that um, even the use of instruments, and again, uh, sort of comparing to the saxophone, right? The electric guitar, the synthesizer, uh, when you have distorted sounds, these are sounds that again, are, are sort of falling beyond the norms of, of acceptability with regard to uh, Soviet censors. We have a lot of um, music, especially rock music that is circulated on bootleg cassettes. So a lot's been written about Magnitizdat, right? Self-made uh, copies of, of uh, music that's recorded in apartments and circulated and like-minded individuals then are in the know, right? And this in the know is very important because music becomes the, the delineating factor. Are, are you with us or are you against us? And for those who have never heard of Rakhna Kostyak, I just always love to give this example of uh, the LPs that are copied on X-ray discs. And some of the music that's copied uh, comes from the West. Uh, so you'll see that there are different ways that rock is politicized because it's association with the West, um, but also uh, there's a very local way that these uh, rock aesthetics are appropriated. So where do all these genres go in 1990 in Ukraine? Um, first, we have to consider the fact that the Ukrainian SSR, again, was closely uh, intertwined with, uh, with the uh, 
Russian strongholds, so Moscow, St. Petersburg, the centers that controlled the music industry for all of the, uh, the Soviet Union um, also had very specific interests for uh, Kyiv, partly because you know, the word Ukraine means borderland, right? So it is the extension of the Russian empire. So historically, Ukraine always had a much stronger interest for um, Moscow and, and, and the leaders than not to, not to say that other republics didn't, but there was, again, this very specific uh, relationship. And so people living in Ukraine also had a very strong uh, connection to Moscow and St. Petersburg. And when you're looking at this exchange and this collapse, um, what we have is a period of time where people simply are not able to produce, partly because of the shock of what's actually happening, uh, partly because all of the venues uh, where music was produced are now gone, right? So all the networks, uh, the recording networks, um, the distribution networks are, are no longer in play. And this period, especially the early 90s, uh, we see a, a drop in sort of official uh, distributions of popular music unofficial distributions, right? Moving from Magnitistat in the USSR, we have uh, piracy. So piracy at this time is through the roof. And Ukraine is one of the top countries at this time uh, where there are um, illegally distributed compact discs. They're coming in from Europe. Much of this is music uh, out of the West. Um, and the black market is where music is circulated. Eventually compact discs turn into MP3s and that's where a lot of the music is then um, distributed. So unofficially that is what's happening. Officially, uh, we have people in power who are not necessarily interested in seeing uh, Ukrainian language music um, on the radios uh, or having representations of Ukrainian folk culture in a public sphere. Um, these are people that are still strongly connected to the networks of the Soviet Union. And they, um, we refer to them as oligarchs, uh, many of them through great uh, corruption, um, gain control of the media. And so as we've seen everything that's been happening in the United States uh, recently, so when you have control of the media and fake news, uh, a lot of things happen. And so much of this is what's actually happening in Ukraine uh, in the 1990s, going into the early 2000s, which, uh, eventually leads to these revolutions of the 2000s. So it is in this context that we engage with hip hop for the first time. And we're looking at the late 1990s and there's a group by the name of Tanok na Maidani Congo, Dance on Congo Square. They are one of the top groups that continues to be at the forefront of hip hop uh, in Ukraine today. Um, they're closer to my age than, than yours, but uh, they, what's interesting about them is that they come from Eastern Ukraine. So Kharkiv, which is a, a city, a Russian speaking city, very close to the Russian uh, border. Uh, it's not necessarily a place that you would consider uh, access uh, to Western genres to be greater than somewhere else. One might think that the capital cities uh, are, are the place where much of this is developed. And that is true, that Kyiv eventually emerges as the capital of the, of the Ukrainian music industry. But at this time in the 1990s, it's very much people are trying to find connections uh, among each other and to help each other out. And so in Kharkiv, we have this group that is, is very much aware of what is happening uh, in European hip hop, which is very much uh, aware of what is happening in US hip hop. Um, they take as their name the reference to New Orleans Congo Square, and this is why I told you a little bit about jazz in the Soviet Union. So why would a hip-hop group 
name themselves after a jazz reference. And part of this has to do with African-American identity and how it's being circulated and perceived in Ukraine at this time. So when I talked about the black market, one of the things that I uh, wanted to articulate further was that the black market was all about goods and products that were perceived to come from the United States. And part of this has to do with um, capital consumption. So logos uh, and, and this kind of consumption that has to do with uh, presenting oneself as being cosmopolitan, as moving beyond the limit, uh, the limits of, on goods in the Soviet Union and being able to present oneself like this. Um, and so with, uh, with what is authentic American becomes synonymous with African American. And the idea is that a black person speaking English becomes the symbol for what is American. And this is something that I write about extensively in my book, um, Hip Hop Ukraine. Um, I actually have it here. So I'll show you. So the, uh, the, the you can see the cover is African musicians. Um, in Ukraine who are represented in the media as African Americans. So it's a very fascinating uh, aspect of all of this. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to address that in the question and answer. Um, but in any case, so Tanakta Maidani Congo, uh, referencing to Congo Square. And let's just see a little bit of this example. And you can see again, make me a hip hop, um, Make me a hip, make me a hop. Um, but the references to the lyrics are very local, right? They're very village almost. Um, I love Hrits. Hrits is a, is, is a very a rural name. It's a Ukrainian name. Um, and what's interesting, again, that in, in this part of Eastern Ukraine that is mostly Russian speaking at this time, um, you have a group that is referencing uh, African-American jazz identities using hip hop as a way to articulate themselves as Ukrainians. So I love Hritz, I only love Hritz because Hritz has a half a strawberry in his pocket. And you can in, infer what this is. And um, at this time, one has to understand that there's a hypersexualization of gender. So men, uh, the mafia image is very strong. For women, um, it's it's, it's, it almost goes into this idea of prostitution. Um, at this time, many people are leaving Ukraine and there is uh, um, also uh, 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 especially for women, um, they're being um, sort of manipulated to leave and they end up uh, in the underground sex trade. So, so they're called Natasha's. And so this is, this is part of the stereotype of the gender stereotype um, that will be addressed in the second half. So let's just watch a little bit of this. You have one woman, uh, she's silent. Um, you see her body uh, and, she, and it's, it's basically being sung on, on her behalf that, that she is desiring all of these young men. I did want to just point uh, a little bit to the imagery that you see in this video. Uh, this is clearly, uh, it's looking like uh, a collapsed building or, or something is, is uh, you know, in, in an urban decay uh, type of context. Much of the countryside actually looks like this um, for a very long time going into even the, you know, the 2010s. And partly uh, some of these buildings are uh, the remnants of uh, collective farms that people are no longer uh, uh, working at, uh, factories uh, decay. Again, that urban decay is, is a very strong element of this. And so this reclaiming of the public space, but also hearkening to a lot of the hip hop videos coming out of the United States um, at that time, or even earlier, uh, talking about the street and reclaiming the street. So again, um, this is just a little bit to, to have this as a comparison and I'll move on in the interest of time. So in the 2000 Orange Revolution, uh, rap is not the, the uh, at that time, the, the genre of choice. Uh, it just happens that rap starts to lend itself uh, for easily sampling uh, politicians' voices, uh, protesters' voices, um, and it's, it's 
there's also a lot more technology that starts to come around at this time and the internet booms, right? So prior to 2004 in the Orange Revolution, and a part of this has to do with um, a stolen election, right? So again, quite similar to some of the stories that we've been going through recently. Um, uh, and, and basically, uh, we have the sampling of musicians' voices in this. And the rap that we're going to hear uh, is called um, Razum Nas Bahato. So together we are many. And this was one of the uh, appropriated chants uh, for, the, for this um, a political event. Um, you can see imagery of Kyiv, uh, Maidan, and so this independence square uh, becomes central to all of the political events uh, in Ukraine. Um, what's interesting about this example is that this is a political rap that eventually becomes, or the year after this, becomes uh, the Ukraine's entry for the Eurovision contest. So again, when I said that all music in Ukraine is political, sometimes it gets politicized and, and or the intent is political. So let's just hear a little bit of this. And this basically means you know, the chant is together we are many, uh, we will not be defeated. And the chant is no lies, um, no corruption. And, and this is the first setup for what then happens 10 years after this. Defeated, and then the reference to no, no to corruption, and yes to the candidate of the choice. Um, what was interesting about this rap, uh, or again, you can you could see that the hip hop and rap. I mean, the, these these labels are. are thrown onto songs that might not necessarily be marketed as such uh, in another country. But you had everybody from an 80 year old grandmother rapping this and singing this to, to somebody coming up the, um, you know, in their youth. So these are very formative events. Um, so after this event in 2004, you see a Ukrainian language rap, um, you, you see this break from the ol oligarch control of the media um, for the first time. Um, and this becomes a huge event in the history of, of uh, the music industries in Ukraine. And so all of these other genres that really didn't have a niche yet or didn't have an opportunity to be ex explored um, now make it onto the screen. And so this next example is just a fusion example. It's, it's rock. Uh, rap, and then a little bit of this folklore. Um, what's interesting, again, in the role of women here, um, this is folklore that's, that's the, the lyrics are uh, that my, uh, my Cossack husband um, has sent me out into the snow barefoot. And so when we start to look at some of the folklore that's pre-Soviet that's being brought back, uh, you know, there, there are some some issues that start to come up with this. Um, but here again, you have a very strict uh, division between um, male and female. Um, and you'll see again that the males are rapping and then the women are singing in this folk genre. And what's interesting in the history, in the study of folk music, the majority actually are women today in Ukraine. And again, we can address that a little bit later. Море тьма один 
So there's a lot going on in that video. And like I said, in terms of the imagery and being brought in the fusion genres, um, that's a very good example of, um, of sort of the creativity and the bringing of all these kinds of strands. Uh, even though, again, the incorporation of the folklore uh, really puts a very uh, complex bent on it. On the other hand, it also shows where society was at at the time. Um, you know, we're talking about a country that really has gone through so much change. We have economic collapse, we have political change, we have revolution after revolution. Um, so um, I, and, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to actually talk about the year of my done. This actually happens a lot because I experienced PTSD from uh, those images in 2014. So I will move um, ahead, but I, I do want to simply say that, that young people that have that were born uh, in the 1990s, in the 2000s, what they have actually already experienced, what brings us after Euromaidan, and again, very similar imageries, although extreme violence, um, Crimea is annexed by uh, Russia. There's still uh, uh, violence on the Eastern Front. We have uh, two, I won't actually go into all of that because you can really read about um, all of that on your own, but this is where we're at. And I just wanted to end my presentation with Yarmak. And you can see with the lyrics that we're in a very different place, a very different headspace when it comes to hip hop today. It's a very authentic place. It's, it's not uh, appropriating, it's, it's not fusing. Um, and I'll just uh, allow you to read it on your own, but simply to say that last, that last line, a child grows up in a cold stone forest. Uh, the reference being to the Spalni to the uh, to the areas of town uh, where there are very large high rises, uh, food deserts, um, and and basically um, the experiences that that the parents of these children have gone through as well, right? So, um, you know, when your own youth continues to be taken away from you, and this is one of the things that I experienced a lot as a researcher in Ukraine. So in my uh, 20s and my 30s, there were many women in their 30s and 40s at these hip hop clubs because they were among those whose youth was lost um, in the transition from the 80s to the 90s. Okay, so I will uh, play just a little bit of this, uh, but you can see right away that the dialogue to this video is the boy asks the father where the microphone is, and the father says, I don't know. Я не понял, микрофон мой где? Какой микрофон? Я не видел. Бля, может нас обокрали? Ох и сука ты. Че? Иди сюда, щенок! Передвигаясь ловко Я еще даже не понял, кто я толком Холодный взгляд, руки как у Волга Эта среда очень держаться скучно Из десяти семей тут девять неблагополучных На небе снова много тучно В этом дурдоме, сука, не бывает скучно С кого пример тут брать? В этом квартале модно воровать и брать Ребенку страшно спать Старики um, and simply say that that example was in Russian. Uh, the uh, the musician is uh, 
out near Kyiv, and we see again uh, just uh, an expansion of the themes and the topics that are uh, prevalent in Ukrainian hip hop today. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Yeah, and thank you. Um, it's always a little bit weird on these Zoom calls and everyone's muted and you sort of stop talking and there's no response. But that that was really fascinating and I'm sure that there are gonna be a lot of questions just in those few examples. Um, there's so much richness and history and change. Um, mm -hmm. So our next presentation is a joint presentation by Dr. Maria Sonovitsky and Dr. Galina Yarmanova. So Maria Sonovitsky is an assistant professor of ethnomusicology at the University of California, Berkeley. Her research focuses primarily on post-Soviet Ukraine, where she's investigated topics such as discourses of sovereignty and wildness in post-Soviet Ukrainian popular music, folklore revivals after state socialism, and the effects of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster on the revival of rural musical uh, repertoires. In 2015, Smithsonian Folkways released the um, project, the, Quir the Chernobyl Songs Project, Living Culture from a Lost World, which she helped to produce. And her first book, Wild Music, Sound and Sovereignty in Ukraine, was published in October of 2019, and it just won the 2020 Lewis Lockwood Award from the American Musicological Society, which is just a really great honor and very excited that a book about Ukraine has won that, that prize. So congratulations, uh, Maria. Um, Dr. Galina Yermanova teaches feminist and queer theory at the sociology department at Kiev Mohila Academy. She edited and co-authored collective research publications called Gender Nationalism and Religion in Ukraine and LGBT Families in Ukraine. She also co-edited the textbook on gender theory called Gender for Media, together with Maria uh, Mayerchik and Olga Plachotnik. Her current research collaboration focuses on sexualities in late Soviet Ukraine and includes a short documentary film called The Wonderful Years, which is co-directed with Svetlana Shimko from 2018. So welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you for inviting us to present today. Welcome everyone. Um, Adriana, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we will talk about um, something a little bit different. Um, since their emergence in the Ukrainian music sphere in recent years, Alona, Alona and Alina Pash, two women rappers from Ukraine, have attracted considerable media attention for putting powerful and also often non-normative images of Ukrainian womanhood into circulation through their bold um, hip hop in Ukrainian. And both uh, rappers also foreground images of rurality and folk femininity. And today um, we will observe how both rappers thematize ideas about class, gender and body politics in their music and in what Alona Alona has described as rap for the village. Um, and also in turn how they are depicted through media narratives. And we argue that from one perspective, their feminist land has enabled a shape shift in body politics, one that refuses oppressive normative body expectations from women, uh, while simultaneously asserting cis heteronormative femininities that reproduce some of the very same constraints that they seem to want to challenge. And similarly, both demonstrate a sensitivity to politics of class in post-Soviet Ukraine, while at times seeming to exoticize poverty and rurality for non-Ukrainian viewers. So this is a new project for us and a new collaboration um, for us. So we're going to aim to give some broader context and overview rather than a deep lit, lit review um, with a focus today, especially on these axes of gender and class. So I'm just going to go ahead and anticipate the question of why we aren't focusing on race, which uh, Dr. Hedwig so nicely um, kind of teed up for us. Um, and there are a few reasons for this. One is that in um, evaluating different media narratives, Anglophone and Ukrainian Russian media narratives, we um, what really jumps out are the politics of gender. 
um, and class and the way that those things are talked about. And perhaps the absence of race in those narratives is itself a story that we will eventually tell. So I wanna say also that in the future, we do intend to take that on more fully and would definitely welcome questions about um, more directly about race um, in the Q&A today. So for this presentation today, first we would like to introduce Alona Alona and Alina Pash, examining contrasting Ukrainian and Russian language versus Anglophone media narratives about them. Um, and what we will show is some friction in how uh, these artists are depicted as feminists, as political, as activists, depending as also as coming from the village, depending um, on which public they're speaking to. And then we will show you a video of their collaboration on a song called um, Padlo, which roughly can be translated as jerk in English. And we'll try to tease out how some of these tensions are thematized and presented in this work. Yeah, so we'll start with Alona Alona, who is perhaps one of the um, most well known popular music artists in Ukraine right now. Um, and what I did here is create a word cloud based on a number of Anglophone media narratives about Alona Alona. So I want to highlight just a few themes that emerge uh, when observing these narratives. The first is her size, that she is a plus size icon. Um, and this appears uh, maybe most prominently in much of the media because it appeared in, a, in an article that was widely syndicated around the world from India to the UK um, to parts to France to other locations around the world. So her, her plus size, the size of her body is a really big theme and twinned with uh, body positivity um, or fat positivity, which is equated to a form of feminist activism. And in general, she is then linked to a number of other social justice causes. Um, and the thing I want to emphasize in these narratives is that the kind of political activism here is not presented in Anglophone media narratives as especially fraught. It's sort of legible for um, familiar to us as Anglophone speakers, perhaps um, in ways that we would understand existing feminisms. Another dominant theme that recurs, you can see this in the up left corner here, is that she was a kindergarten teacher. This recurs in media narratives, um, Anglophone media narratives about Alona Alona. She's a kindergarten teacher, um, and this feeds into this kind of feminized idea of care. Um, she repeats herself um, in multiple interviews, quote, I am not a kind I'm a kindergarten teacher, not a gangster. Um, so again, kind of a racialized trope for, for sure, um, also signaling um, some of that racial anxiety. And then another uh, pervasive trope in these Anglophone media narratives is the idea of quote unquote, the village, uh, as though there were something uh, so static. <laughs> uh, so the idea of the village is presented in a kind of unproblematic way that this is a rapper from the village who speaks for the village. Um, and we can trouble that the ease of that um, idea in when we look at the other narratives. Um, and then the last point I want to make is that her language choice is um, is a recurring theme in a lot of Anglophone media narratives. And um, the fact that she raps in Ukrainian um, is a story that is told everywhere. This is explicitly connected to the Maidan, from what I could tell, to the Maidan revolution in these Anglophone media narratives. So her choice to rap in Ukraine, Ukrainian is presented as a decision born out of this moment of intense political upheaval. Um, and this is also a very convenient narrative uh, for Western audiences to consume a sort of flattened idea of what was happening on the ground there. Um, so this is also tied in to her language choice is politicized as a fact of the kind of self-actualization of Ukraine, that this is a symptom of Ukraine and Ukrainian popular music really finding itself. Um, and so that will be the last point I make about Anglophone media narratives. Um, Ukrainian and Russian language media narratives contrast in some places overlap in others, but generally they give much more nuance, I think, um, because there's no need to explain the general context or to um, um, yeah, to explain where, where she's coming from to the uh, people who read it in Ukraine. And so um, 
the fact that she is a woman rapping is a recurring theme. Um, and um, on the one hand, she was, um, she coordinated this big uh, women in rap uh, online community for some time and she opposes herself in some interviews, she opposes herself as uh, someone who um, writes real rap as um, contrasted to most of the women in rap who write uh, like the typical women in rap writing sappy tracks about love and heartbreak. But at the same time, she is of course celebrated by the feminist community here as someone who is popularizing women in rap and she received the awards for this as a, um, for instance, awards from UN Women and so on. So she's someone who works with gender issues uh, also because she is a woman who raps in itself, right? And so um, the regular person trope is similar to Anglophone narratives, um, but at the same time, there is more diversity about her uh, professional background. There's a lot of materials that she was um, also part of uh, low paid but honorable jobs, not just as a kindergarten teacher, but also as a social worker, as a cashier. Um, in the store. And so her political work on topics such as environment, as gender-based violence, as anti-bullying comes a lot um, as an exploration of the social injustices that, that she's seen, but still from this a very clear perspective of a regular person who's seen a lot of suffering and not necessarily as a... Um, activist and we find that this is one of the most extreme extreme contrasts in the media narratives um, that she actually at some point she says я и есть представитель body позитива крути не крути но я не лидер и не какой-то там супер активист basically she is saying to the esquire journal in russian that she is um, that she is not a super activist or a leader even though she represents body positivity ideas. And um, at the same time, the language politics are also not as directly tied to Maidan um, and are more naturalized. Her Ukrainian uh, lyrics are more naturalized as a sort of a very um, uh, natural thing to, to do now and which doesn't need necessarily an explanation, even though she rapped before in Russian for sometime and she also uses um, Al-Qaeda nickname um, before that she kind of distances herself from. And this is also something we might want to explore later. And um, generally um, there is this narrative um, about uh, demonstrating to Europe who we are. Um, she talks a lot about her tattoo, that she has a tattoo on her right arm and she holds Mike in her right arm during the concerts. And this is a tattoo of Petrikivsky Rospis, which is like this Ukrainian style of painting. And she says that with that, she wants to show who we are as Ukrainians, that we are awesome, socially oriented and modern, and that it's clear right away for her audiences internationally that where she comes from. Um, we want to show you um, her breakout hit, uh, Rybki, meaning fish. This is a, a video that went viral and that made her very popular. And um, you will see that this is a video uh, was extremely limited budget. Uh, that, for instance, on the motorbikes uh, that you will see, it says motorbikes for rent and a phone number that you can call to get it. And so um, at the same time, we, we want uh, to explain a little bit about the metaphor of fish she uses as a title. She, um, at some point, this uh, she explained this as something against slut shaming um, or uh, that this is fish is about being an outsider or um, being perceived only as a sexual object. There was also debate in lesbian circles whether this was a feminist lesbian song which uh, where a woman talks about other women or fish um, as a genitalia, which is used derogatory, but also can be reclaimed. 
Um, and we just want to give you a little taste of uh, her work, uh, and we will just show you first 35 seconds of this video. So just a brief kind of taste of what that uh, Rivki was like. And then shortly on the heels of Rivki, I guess, number one, uh, we have Rivki number two uh, produced in the same year. We won't show you a clip, but I just uh, froze two stills from this. And I think um, what I want to highlight here is that Rivki two was presented as a um, within the frame of a kind of absurd children's uh, television programming uh, called um, Children's Time. And uh, when I first viewed it, um, I really, it conjured for me the aesthetics of like the Zach Galifianakis uh, comedy Between Two Ferns, if you've seen that, it has a kind of similar absurdism to it. Um, where this, the host of the program is interviewing Alona Alona, um, and they show a blooper reel basically of that. And then she raps for an audience of school children and she does the Rifki rap for these uh, school children. Um, the, the question of why it was important to rehearse this song or reframe this song in this way is one that we considered. And we thought it might be um, in part due to the fact that there was some backlash to the first video and the fact that she was so proudly displaying her body in that swimsuit and on the jet ski. Um, so you can see here in the, that she's performing a kind of respectability politics um, that is also at the same time deeply absurd. She's, pub she's rapping for this public of um, school children. Okay, moving on. So we'll talk a little bit about, about Alina Pash. And I did the same thing here, which is I created a word cloud, although this is a little bit less robust in the sense that there are fewer Anglophone media narratives about Alina Pash, who is the other rapper we want to talk about. Um, so th there are a few things I want to highlight here. The first is the fact that Alina Pash comes from Transcarpathia or Zakarpatia. She's from Bushteno and Zakarpatia, very close to the Romanian border. Um, and so the fact of her regional identity, which is also closely associated with a rural identity, is pervasive in Anglophone narratives. Um, even though she, she went to college, she went to circus school in Kiev, but the, the, her roots in Transcarpathia, which are also on full display in her first hit, which we'll listen to in a, in a little bit, um, is a real recurring theme. Another is her journey, uh, which included that she wanted for a long time to be a police officer, which is what her father was, um, but then eventually decided to be a performer. Um, the narrative of self-actualization, again, of kind of Ukrainians realizing themselves that this is a representation of a new generation of Ukrainians finding their voices is another recurring theme here, that Alina Pash is, a, is the representative of this new generation of Ukrainians finding their place in the world. And then I'll just highlight also that bitanga, which is this word in purple, sort of on the bottom quadrant of the, of the diagram, bitanga, which means hooligan um, in Transcarpathian dialect, uh, was her breakout hit um, in, and it uses a term associated with Zakarpatska Hovirka, or I'm translating that as dialect here. And again, we'll listen to that shortly. Um, in Ukrainian language and Russian language media narratives about Alina Pash, there's a lot of um, mentioning that she was a runner up in X Factor um, and that she uh, played with uh, pop singers. And so uh, she celebrated as this person bringing innovation to the music and also making, um, bringing international fame to Ukrainian music music through merging hip hop with transcribing folklore. But it's also clear that this choice for her is quite strategic. She says that in order to be internationally successful and that it's important to be internationally successful because Ukrainian um, music industry is not as 
necessarily big as she would like to, that it's important to stand out and to bring something more interesting to the international audiences. Um, and for instance, Daha Braha is a, a group that has this niche. And so it's um, quite clear that she's also working uh, with uh, this idea of women's empowerment. She talks about how she is a tomboy from a model family, and that this image of princess was imposed on her, but she rejected it. At the same time, her heterosexuality is uh, reassured in many of her, like in most of her work. Um, but she works with this idea of um, strong womanhood, strong women, um, and this is in the context where a lot of there are a lot of books and general images about strong women, strong girls. Good night stories uh, for rebel girls come out in Ukrainian um, before she makes her breakout hit, and so um, it's interesting that she works uh, explicitly with the topics such as sexism and feminism and LGBT friendliness. But she uh, is careful not to overstate the radicalism of her politics um, in Ukrainian um, and uh, Russian uh, media narratives. And she's also distancing herself uh, from rhetorics of nationalism and patriotism. At the same time, she's associated with repping for the president Zelensky during the International Day concert um, a couple of years ago. So in 2019, Alina Pash has her breakout hit with this um, rap uh, song called Bitanga. And we'll just play um, a one minute clip for you. And it's a slightly longer clip only because I really wanted to include the Supilka solo <laughs> that, that enters uh, towards the end. And that is a very clear sonic marker, again, of, um, of Zakarpatia and neighboring regions that are associated with this particular kind of wooden flute sound. So you'll hear that here. Пусть мій татко добрий, музика там грає файно, йо Уже всі звізди зазорялись, чекай на мене там Іванко Хочу відкрутила, щоб усім любила, цвіти чивоненьке мамчиня Швариш раченьки, щоб була фененька, а вікна і вся фігня Файно пустіття, я не філю, мене чекає вже біля села Я знаю там, я не чесний бій танго, він мене може не раз і не два Айно пустіття, я сьогодні тусую, ніч не студена і я не мала Um, so, uh, so we've introduced Alona Alona and Alina Pash through these media narratives that in some places are compatible and in some places are in some tension. Um, and now we want to turn to the kind of core example that we're going to talk about, um, which is uh, the song Padlo uh, that was mentioned before. We, we're going to translate Padlo here as jerk, although you'll see other pejoratives stand in for, for that term here. And um, I, I think we're going to show you the entirety of this video, but before we do that, we wanted to point out some things to listen for and consider as you listen, um, in some cases, probably for the first time to this. Um, so a few things. The first is the narrative. This is really a kind of sci-fi narrative. It, uh, the story of the video was written by Alina Pasha's French partner, but the rap itself was composed by Alona Alona and featured on her record, um, Pushka. Um, it's set in the year 2049, which may be a reference to Blade Runner 2049, um, for those familiar, in a place called Patriarchalny Chorno Bidlohrad, um, in, in basically an urban apocalypse landscape. And the term that they use, uh, Patriarchalny Chorno Bidlohrad, um, is also a kind of classist way to indicate that this is a um, urban apocalypse cityscape populated by uneducated people. Um, so the narrative goes that powerful female strength can redeem the world and that women's destiny, in fact, is to make the world a better place. 
Um, this is this happens uh, when women are called to uh, this apocalyptic zone to determine sort of the next appointee who will redeem the world. This happens through the bird of destiny, a magical chicken that uh, lays eggs with magical information that will restore balance to the world. And so this kind of chicken trope um, is also an index of rurality and is also intimately connected to a recurring image of the pisanka or the Easter egg, which is also closely associated with Ukrainian folk arts. You will also see matriarchy tropes um, in this video that there is the video involves intergenerational Ukrainian matriarchy. Um, there is reference to uh, Berehina and Hestia, which is Ukrainian and Greek references uh, to women guardians, domestic icons, hearse bearers. There is also um, the imagery of pesanki, eggs, Easter, like as a springtime renewal, fertility, Christianity, and there is um, one of the video um, creators said that there is this um, phrase that every day will be like an Easter, and this is, uh, he says, is a national Ukrainian nirvana, because at Easter nobody is sad, everyone is warm, and it's all very tasty, and this is a big celebration in a family circle. And so um, matriarchy here is folkloric and rural in nature, and it's grounded in a rural idea of femininity, but we will say more after we watch the video. Yeah, great. And the last things we just want to highlight are two kind of vocal strategies that occur in this video. The first is for, for people familiar with Ukrainian uh, folk music, the very first voice you hear is Nina Matvienko's voice. This is a really iconic voice of Ukrainian music, uh, crossover into popular music, but closely associated with a kind of folk femininity. Um, in a Sluch Media article about this video, uh, Nina Matvienko is referred to as the mega berehenya of the universe. Um, so even though she's not singing here, the fact of her, the inclusion of her voice is signifying this kind of intergenerational, matriarchal folk femininity. Um, and then the last thing I want to call attention to is the way that the chorus sounds. The chorus, uh, which you'll be hearing a lot, it repeats frequently, um, is really merging to my ears, hip hop production strategies, especially a lot of auto tune with a kind of rural texture and vocality. So in particular, a lot of very close intervals. So that's something else that you can pay attention to as you listen. Um, we will show you the video with subtitles and I was subtitling it yesterday and in the process um, of subtitling, I was also thinking about the gap between this video narrative created um, uh, by um, Nathan um, Daisy, Daisy. Yeah. Um, and uh, the lyrics, the song text from Alona, Alona. And uh, we will focus mostly on the video narrative, although if you, maybe you can pay attention to this and see how there is um, explicit fat pride and agency and this idea of women's rap as sacral and something that has authority, which is not necessarily reflected closely in the video. Rick, 2049. Патріархальний Чорнобидлоград У місті зникають чоловіки Берегині гестії з'явилися, щоб відшукати обрану Яка отримає дар птахи долі Та жіночу волю зробити світ кращим Вітаю, з вами Слухмедіа І ми знаходимося на місці, де через 20 Але обраний отримає магічну писанку Захист приміщення, але всі чекають ще одного прибуття, одного ухвування. Жить на 
быдло Зараляже на дно Кто там сказал на мамку падло Крашу писанки я, як Пикассо падло Пит все любви, play repeat Ты веришь в меня, ты не еретик Я твое слово, твой дагеротип Хай нитки рвут за шить роты Мой объем растет, числа фиба начи Хитай люд, мов дитячий мячик А кто там сход, я несу поживно Голодный пист, мое слово жирно Эй, кто там мое сбитый прицел Я хочу сесть, это треба пара сельцев Я открыла рот и мне аплодуют Поглянь на меня, хиба в рэпе не ходуют Хитай задом, хитай зали Зи мною в лифте, кто из другой займи Я сию слово делюсь, взаймы читаю так Щоб всі ви знали Хто там сказав на мамку падло Кому жить набридло Зараз ляже на дно Хто там сказав на мамку падло Крашу писанки я Як Пікасо Пабло Я листаю новини, там стільки свинини, вам далеко до справжній паші Я за тебе, ви викупите мій персонаж Піднялася рибка і само одна, залізла на гору сама Казали не вийти, бо тупо мала, це мала, послала і грав Рок у своє, а в день тут мій слух Прокачую дух, щіком на лайк Хто там сказав на мамку падло, кому жить набридло Зараз ляже на дно, хто там сказав на мамку падло, крашу писанки я, як Пікасо Пабло Хто там сказав на мамку падло, кому жить набридло, зараз ляже на дно Хто там сказав на мамку падло, крашу писанки я, як Пікасо Пабло Врешті берегині передали обрані знання, як влаштований світ зовній середині. І тепер вона має потужну жіночу силу, і кожен день буде їй як великий день. That moment when the pisanka sings is, always gets me. Um, so to just further pull on a few threads here, uh, we want to situate um, some of our interpretations in existing scholarship, um, including our own scholarship. Um, so. Um, so we find Maria Majerczyk research on um, the role of erotic folklore in the invention of modern sexuality, very relevant. Um, Majerczyk talks about how um, nas romantic nationalism uh, constructs uh, folklore, um, narodna kultura, which could be roughly translated as folklore, as the basis for the nation, as the essence of the nation, and how it constructs it as pure, as um, um, not uh, corrupted to by uh, urban decay yet, but at the same time emancipated from this uh, wild uh, promiscuity of the nature. And um, this imagery of um, this imagery of uh, traditional rural uh, roots, uh, Ukrainian rural roots, 
um, as something um, pure and um, an essence of the nation is also invoked a lot in the uh, current uh, right uh, wing nationalist um, depictions and um, research on neo-traditionalism um, shows how these ideas um, are um, popular in the recent backlash which sometimes is called anti-gender movement, uh, but basically broader describes re religious right organizing, which is anti-gender, anti-abortion, anti-gay, and is quite popular in the Eastern Europe and in Ukraine um, in particular, and is also often related to the rise of the Christian right in the United States and throughout the world um, and to the um, ideas of white supremacy. And so in this uh, neo-traditionalist conservative rhetoric, LGBT um, movement and feminism uh, are said to emasculate men and to threaten family and nation itself. And so the logic goes that feminism um, is not necessarily for Ukraine because Ukraine, as opposed to Russia, has always been a matriarchy. And so the logic, uh, but by, by this logic, the solution is, um, uh, lies in a return to our traditional uh, roots um, from this um, invented mythology. And so this becomes an answer to Russian imperialism, but also Western colonialism. And this is an argument for Ukrainian exceptionalism. And uh, you can see in the beginning in this video where the narrator Nina Matvienko, the great matriarch um, of the country, says that men are disappearing. And we read this as um, this refrain uh, of the right wing that there are no real men left. And so we think this thematizes this anxiety. And so this recovering a historical pastoral female power um, in part through the magical chicken, otherwise known as the bird of destiny, um, and Pesanka, here is seen as, um, as a great solution, as a hope for the future. And the last point uh, is, is it, it grows out of my own work um, from my first book, Wild Music, um, this idea of sovereign imaginaries. And one of the things I was observing there was that there's a recurring trope through popular music of Ukrainian renewal that and this is rooted in Ukrainian ideas of the folk, including the mythos of matriarchy. Um, if you're familiar with Ruslana's catalog, you could probably assimilate that idea very easily. Um, and this promise of Ukrainian self actualization through popular music um, is something that we can see recurring at, arguably uh, since 1991, um, and perhaps even earlier. <laughs> uh, in fact, Johann Gottfried Herder is on the record saying so uh, back in the 18th century. So there's this discourse of renewal, but it is always framed with as a binary choice between Europe or Russia. And what we were trying to show here in part through the media narratives is that Anglophone media narratives in particular are trying to slot these women into pre-existing um, narratives, especially about feminism or to establish their identities as uh, quote unquote European or Western. So in conclusion, we are witnessing how these powerful voices in the Ukrainian media sphere right now are challenging normative ideas of femininity, of class, of body politics, um, and of geopolitics while remaining constrained in their subversive power through uh, different structures, including the structures of the music industry, um, which is more lucrative in uh, Europe and the West perhaps than in other directions they could face, um, but also in these powerful pre-existing narratives about gender class and geopolitics that have been defined as being either or, either European, Western, or Russian, and something else. Um, so we will just end there in the interest of time for today and uh, welcome any questions you might have during the Q&A. Thank you both so much. Yeah, there's so much here. I feel like we need like a whole day to go through even just a few of these, um, a few of these, these artists that we've, we've touched on today. So um, we do have a question that came in from the YouTube channel, um, which is, I guess, have you done or what do you think the difference would be if you did a word cloud 
of the Ukrainian media coverage of a figure like Alyona Alyona? Is it is it quite different? Like, is there, you know, are you seeing that there's a distinction between sort of local local coverage versus international coverage of her um, or not, I guess? Elena, do you want to speak to that? Or should I? Okay, I'll just say quickly, we tried to make a word cloud um, from the Ukrainian Russian, um, and maybe someone out there has a tip, but we weren't able to easily find a way to generate a word cloud based on those narratives. Um, I think they probably would be somewhat different. I think some of the key terms, especially some of the more nuanced key terms, um, the more kind of contextual key terms just w that don't appear in the Anglophone context might appear in a word cloud, but I imagine there would be substantial overlap as well. Um, yeah, do you want to add anything? I think the, the difficulty for this was because we were working with both Russian and Ukrainian languages because like, for instance, for Alona Alona, one of her big interviews, which is quoted in Ukrainian media was actually done with Russian journal and so when you're trying to put the cloud for two different languages, it's really technically very different. And so also because there's like all those gendered endings that, so basically it just shows you that the most common words are and, no, and <laughs> rap and woman, which we thought maybe is not <laughs> sufficient. <laughs> But uh, I think that um, it could be quite interesting. We wanted to show some Cyrillics also on the screen just to add a little confusion maybe to those who don't speak Ukrainian or Russian. But um, yeah, this is something maybe for the future work. Cool. So I have a question um, for both of you, for all of you. Um, I know that all of you have worked on other genres of Ukrainian popular music at various points, whether that's folk music or rock. And I just wonder if you see anything that's unique about sort of either the way hip hop is being positioned in society now or what you think its potential might be for opening up a, a, um, a, an outlet for certain groups that maybe aren't represented in other musics. I mean, what is your sort of impression of how this genre particularly fits amongst other Ukrainian popular music genres. I could, I could take just a little bit of this, um, only just going back that hip hop was actually one of the first genres that allowed for more of an androgynous identity. Um, so both young women and men wearing clothes bought in hip hop shops. Um, this was also considered uh, sort of a cosmopolitan way of engaging with the world, uh, BMX biking, um, break dancing, graffiti were all, are all part of this. And so um, I think where this is going is fantastic because this is really just a genre that, that anybody can participate in. I mean, in, in, whether you're thinking of African uh, students, um, there are Koreans and, in, in, you know, rapping in Ukraine, there's, there's Tatar musicians. So this is really one that, that is not limited. So for instance, when, when we're thinking of folk music revivals, there is a huge problem with that because that actually limits by language, it limits by gender, it limits by appearance. Um, you know, and actually I just wanna uh, say that it would be interesting to see how Alana's representation of body um, relates to generational representations of body because she looks like older women, or I mean, maybe not even older women, but there is an aesthetic of, of that type of body presentation of, of women um, in Ukraine. So uh, that's all I'll say, but thank you again for an excellent presentation. I'll jump in quickly just to say that, um, you know, one of the things that I write about in my book is is Dacha Bracha's Carpathian rap, which we didn't talk about today, but um, which became a kind of phenomenon, again, in, in its reception in the West. And that's mostly what I was writing about is this idea, oh my gosh, Ukrainians are rapping and also it's folkloric, right? Um, and I think if anything, it speaks to one of the points that um, Adriana made earlier, which is that some of the genre distinctions are maybe less critical um, at this point particular juncture, probably not only in Ukraine, but in a lot of other contexts as well. And I think that um, one of the things that 
I continue to be really interested in are the ways in which these Ukrainian folk tropes, these like ethnose are invoked through hip hop today and the ways in which the li linguistic politics of that are so particular, right? And I think hip hop globally has been, um, has, has adapted itself to local vernaculars and has created entire new vocabularies. Um, and I think part of what we see happening in Ukraine right now is, is that phenomenon continuing on. Great. Well, we had two really amazing presentations. It's just about 5.30. So um, I will just say that if there are other questions or if people are watching this YouTube stream after the fact, um, please feel free to email the Hunter Music Department email me personally at the Hunter Music Department. And I presume, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I presume any of you would be happy also to receive um, questions after the fact, um, because this will stay up on our Hunter um, Music YouTube channel for a while. Um, so congratulations. Thank you all.